How's everyone doing tonight? Good? Yeah. Well, man, I, I am so honored and excited to be uh, here with you tonight uh, at Momentum. Uh, I, I know you've had a powerful week already that God has moved in your midst, and you've had some uh, great communicators of God's Word uh, come be with you. And so, man, I'm just honored that I get to uh, play a small part in what the Lord is doing uh, among us this week. Um, you're going to hear uh, a lot more about my story in a little bit, uh, but let me just help you with my name, because some of you are like already going, what in the world? The Afshin. How many of you think you can say Afshin? Afshin. You got it. There you go. I always say just think of Afro-Sheen, the hair product, which I'm sure all of you use. Uh, not really. And take the R-O out. You guys don't even know what I'm talking about. It's a long, long time ago. Afro-Sheen. Take the R-O out. You got the Afro. Good job. You take the R-O out and you got my, my, my name, Afshin. So one more time. Just practice Afshin, one, two, three. Afshin. There you go, you got it. My last name is Ziafat, just don't call me Izafat, ho, 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 all right? Or Chia Pet or something like that, I've heard it all. So growing up, yeah, I've heard it. Growing up in Texas, as an Iranian, I had, uh, I, I was called everything under the sun. I was called the Turban Cowboy, which was my favorite, all right? Yeah, Sheik of the Burning Sand, I've heard it all. So yeah, uh, you're gonna hear um, some of my story, but here's what I wanna do tonight. Here's what the Lord has really laid on my heart for us tonight. We've been hearing a whole lot about how God is calling us to go and reach others and make a difference in the least of these. The disenfranchised, the widows and the orphans, as James 1.27 says, that pure religion is that we would visit them and that we would keep ourselves unstained from the world. And so we've talked a whole lot about that, but what, 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 I wanna, what I really want us to grab a hold of tonight is that, that that is an overflow of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ impacting and transforming your life. And so Jesus himself, in fact, uh, there's, a, there's a scripture where Jesus says that when he returns, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep are those who belong to him. And he says to the sheep on his right hand, come into the kingdom that has been prepared for you. Those of you who have been blessed by the Father. All right? And he says, because you saw me naked and you clothed me. You saw me hungry and you fed me. You saw me thirsty and you gave me drink. And they say, when did we do these things? And Jesus says, when you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. And here's what I want you to understand. It's not that they come into heaven because they did these things. It, it, it's, it's, it's actually flipped. It's those of you who've been blessed by God, you've been chosen, God has chosen you out of the world, that the gospel has changed you, and the overflow of it is that you fed the hungry, that you gave drink to the thirsty, that you clothed the naked, that you gave to the poor. And so again, that, that is an evidence that those, those works are not a means to our salvation, but they're an evidence of our salvation. They're an evidence that the gospel has truly transformed us. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab your Bible. Do you have your Bible today? I hope you do. Grab your Bible. And I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians. Turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians. Because in this beginning of this book, we get this writing from the Apostle Paul that I think really shows us what happens when the gospel changes you and how it, how it flows out from you. Let me give you a little quick background. Paul went into the city Thessalonica and he began this church with a small group of believers. But man, people were ticked off because Paul was preaching the gospel. So they come and they persecute him and they drive him out of Thessalonica and they persecute him so much that they followed him to the next town and drove him out of that town also. And so Paul is thinking, man, surely if I got this much heat, th those poor believers that were left behind, man, they probably are going to get so much heat. And so he sends Timothy, his disciple, to Thessalonica to check on the Christians there, to see are they really strong, are they still following God? And the report he gets back is so awesome that, man, he writes this letter that's in our Bible called 1 Thessalonians, gushing with praise to God for how God is using them to make an impact. But every student, look at me now, don't miss this. It's because the gospel changed them and now it is, it, it's like a wave going out. It's like a tsunami. If you think of a tsunami, a, a tsunami happens when an earthquake happens in the ocean floor. So it's in a very local place, there's a jolt, there's an earthquake, but it sends waves that have destruction miles away. In the same way, but opposite, 
God wants to so displace, if you will, our heart with his love that from us would flow waves, not of destruction, but waves of life and hope that will impact others. And I want you to see this in 1 Thessalonians. And let's, let, let's, let's pray before we read. <coughs> Father God, we thank you for your word. And we come to your word now expecting, God, for you to speak to our hearts. So, Lord, open our eyes to see you, to see the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ, to understand the gospel, and then to understand the call of the gospel on our lives. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. 1 Thessalonians 1. You with me? Say yes. Yeah? Yes. All right. Here we go. Verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And for, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So hear me, guys. Before their life was used to impact the unseen, before that happened, First, what happens is it started with the gospel intersecting their heart. Look at verse 4 one more time. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. And it says, because our gospel came to you. And here's what I want you to understand. Here's the good news of Jesus Christ, that God, you with me, guys, that God chose you. He chose you, the Bible says, before the foundation of the world in Ephesians. So before you could do anything to earn it, that God set his love on you. And by the way, love cannot be earned. Because if it's given based on what we do, it's not love. If I love my wife for what she does for me, then I don't really love her. I love what she does for me. In the same way, it says you know that you've been loved. It's freely given. It means the gospel means that God has done the work, not us. And so I want you to before, I want you to really get this because here's, here, before you think about reaching others, you have to be in awe of the good news that you have in Jesus. And I just wonder, students, are we in awe? And so listen, before you really understand the good news, you have to really understand the bad news first. Because when you get the bad news before Christ, then you'll see how good the good news is. And so I want you to really quickly turn to the left and go to Ephesians, really quickly. We're going to come back to 1 Thessalonians. But go to Ephesians chapter 2. Just turn there and I want you to see what it says here in Ephesians 2. <clears throat> in Ephesians 2 it says in verse 1, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, in whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now students, just hang with me really quickly. I know a lot of times youth speakers come up and they share a bunch of stories. Can I just do a little bit of teaching real quick? Is that cool? Yeah? Is that cool? We'll, we'll get to stories in a second, but can you, can you just bear with me? Because you've got to grab this. Here's the, with the, here's the story of the Bible. The Bible teaches that God created man and woman for perfect relationship with him. All things were created by him, through him, and for him. So you were, you're, originally mankind was created for God. But in Genesis 3, the enemy tempted Adam and Eve and said, wait, God told you not to eat from that tree? Well, God knows if you eat from that tree, you'll become like him. So in essence, the lie was this. God is holding something back from you. Take from the tree. You can be God yourself. So Adam and Eve, they turned from God to idols, if you will. And this is idolatry, when we reach for something outside of God to fulfill us. And they took from the tree, and here's what you got to understand. That's where sin entered the world. That's where broken relationship with God entered the world. And guys, that's where death entered the world. 
Remember he says, if you eat from the tree, you will die. Well, Adam and Eve didn't die physically, did they? Well, how did they die? They died spiritually. And here's what Romans teaches. Don't miss it, guys. Romans teaches that from that moment on, a disease spread to all mankind called sin and its consequence, spiritual death. So listen to me. When you were born, everyone knows your birthday, all right? When you were born, you were born physically alive but spiritually dead. And so that's why in, in, in Ephesians 2, it says you were dead in your sins and trespasses. Guys, Jesus didn't come to make you a better person. He came to make you an alive person. Does that make sense? You were dead before him. I mean, look, you were, this, is, this is your state. I mean, you were spiritually flatlined. And a dead person can't bring himself to life. Someone ha if it said you were sick in your sin, if you were only sick in your sin, then maybe you could do something about it. But guys, it says you were dead in your sin. You know what he's trying to say? There's nothing you could do to make yourself alive. That's why Jesus in John 5, it says that, Jesus says, an hour is coming and is now here that the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and come to life. So some of you, maybe you've been here all week and you haven't responded to Jesus. And let me tell you, you're never going to respond until God by his mercy speaks his word of life and opens your eyes and brings you to life. It's a miracle. It doesn't matter how much we preach up here. And I pray some of you that happens. You were dead. Not only that, look at verse 2. You followed the course of the world following the prince of the power of the air. That's the enemy. And if you don't know the story of the enemy, he wanted to be God and was cast out of heaven. So here's what it's saying. All of mankind before Christ, students, we're following that way. We are enemies of God. Jesus didn't come into this world and we were kind of neutral. No, Jesus came into a world where all of us were enemies. The Bible says we all turned from God. We all went our own way. The Bible says it was my sin that nailed him to the cross. I wasn't just an innocent bystander. No, I was an enemy of God. Romans chapter 5. And you got to get that, man. I, I was preaching at the Southern Baptist Convention to 9,000 pastors. And you know what I said? I said? I said, men, you don't have to even preach in your churches. Go do missions. You just have to get your church to understand the gospel. Because if they understand the gospel, their heart will beat with compassion for people that we think are the enemy. And so I said something, you could hear a, nail, a, a pin drop. I said this, I said, guys, if the Apostle Paul were here today and he heard about Osama bin Laden dying, he wouldn't go to the White House and start high-fiving and hooping and hollering. He would fall on his face and say, God, thank you that you had mercy on me when I was Osama bin Laden. Now I'm not, and I remember he persecuted Christians. Now I'm not condoning terrorism, I'm not condoning Al-Qaeda, I'm not condoning uh, Osama bin Laden, I'm just saying that man, when I understand that I was an enemy of God and saved by his grace, I forfeit the right to celebrate somebody's death who doesn't know Jesus. I can't do it. And now Osama bin Laden may be a a, a radical example, but guys, I travel around this country and preach in churches and people come up with tears in their eyes saying to me, Afshin, forgive me, I've never thought about Muslims that way. I've never cared with, for them that way. And I say, man, don't, don't ask for my forgiveness. Go home and read Romans chapter 5. Go home and read Ephesians chapter 2, how you were an enemy of God. You got to get it, man. Not only were you an enemy of God, you were dominated by sin. Look what it says in verse 3. Among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh. I don't want to harp on this, students, but here's what it's saying. Eyes up here, don't miss it. That not only were you dead, not only were you an enemy of God, but even in, in, within you, you, had, you didn't have a spiritual bone to do anything good for God in your own strength. All of us are slaves to sin, the Bible teaches. Jesus said to a group of Jews that thought they were fine because they could trace their roots back to Abraham. And some of us, by the way, say, oh, Afshin, I'm fine because my parents were Christian. Oh, Afshin, I was born a Christian. Really? Like on the delivery table, you were a Christian, right? I mean, people don't understand. It doesn't pass down through genes. And so Jesus looks at these Jews that thought they were fine because they belonged to Abraham. And he said, I'll tell you the truth. If you sin, you're a slave to sin. 
But if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Within you all are, and there's none righteous, not even one. I know I'm harping on the bad news, but stay with me. you got to get it one more thing. Not only were you dead, an enemy, you're dominated by sin, but guys, you were destined for wrath. Now, some of you are going to say, man, Afshin, did you wake up on the wrong side of your bed? But listen, you, you, I'm not trying to be harsh. I, I want you to see how bad we were before Christ. Look what it says in verse uh, 3. It says that you were by nature, at the end of verse 3, you were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You know what that says? That when we turn from God, that God is a holy God and he must punish sin. And guys, here's what the Bible teaches, that the wrath of God is coming upon sin and upon mankind. And so in John 3, the Bible says that Jesus came into the world, everyone knows John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But if you keep reading, it says, for God didn't send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world. And we think, oh, see, Jesus isn't condemning anyone. But you know what, that's not what it's saying. If you keep reading, it says he didn't condemn because the world was condemned already. That's what it means. He didn't come, he came into a world that was already condemned. And so the Bible says at the end of John 3 that the father loves the son and has given all authority to him. Whoever loves the Son has everlasting life. Whoever does not love the Son does not have everlasting life, but the wrath of God remains upon him. So listen to me, guys. Every eye up here. Before Jesus came into this world, the wrath of God remained on every one of us. When Christ intersected your heart and drew you to faith, you came out from underneath the wrath of God. The Bible says in Romans 3 that Jesus is our propitiation. It's a big word, but that word means this. It's a sacrifice that bears the wrath of God and turns the wrath of God into the favor of God for us. That's what Jesus has done for us. That's why verse 4 goes on to say, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. I, I, do, amen? Yes or no? Yeah? Do you get that? Now listen to me now. Do you really get that? Do you get that, man, I was dead. I was dominated. I was destined for wrath. There's nothing I could do about my situation. If it wasn't for grace, and I say to you, when you really embrace that, listen to me, man, self-entitlement goes out the door. When you really embrace that, my rights go out the door. When you really embrace that, my plan of pursuing the American dream goes out the door. And you say, God, man. I have the greatest thing in life and I will do anything for it. I will, I will lose anything for it because it is the greatest thing in life. And that's why it goes on to say this. Look, at, look what it says next in 1 Thessalonians. Go back to 1 Thessalonians real quickly. Go back to 1 Thessalonians real quickly. Man, it's hot up here. Has any other speaker said that to you? Wow. I should have just said, this is what hell feels like up here. You don't, I'm just kidding. Are y'all cool with, oh, okay. All right. Maybe I was too harsh. You're not, I, I can't laugh now because you were so harsh. All right, go back to 1 Thessalonians. I want you to see this. So they got the gospel. I hope you've got the gospel. And again, if you really get it, look what happens. Jump down to verse 9. Look what it says. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So guys, here's what I'm trying to say. That when you understand how good the good news is, again, you will lose anything for it. It's like Jesus said it this way. That the kingdom of God is like a man who finds a treasure and he buries it in the field and he sells all of his possessions to purchase the field. In other words, guys, when you find the hope of life forever with God, if you treasure it, you would be willing to lose any idol, anything that comes apart uh, in front of God. And for me, I had to learn that really the hard way. 
So I was born in Houston. When I was two years old, my family moved to Iran. How many heard of Iran? Raise your hand if you heard of Iran. Okay, most of you have. If you've been alive, good. All right. So we moved to Iran in the late 70s, way before your time. And in the 70s, an Islamic revolution hit that country. And a, a, an Islamic cleric named the Ayatollah overthrew the Shah, the king of Iran. Fighting broke out. My dad was a doctor. He had the means to get us out. So he got us back to Houston when I was in the middle of uh, first grade. So I left when I was two years old, and I'm back in Houston as a six-year-old. So I didn't speak English. I spoke Farsi, which is the language of Iran. And God, in his incredible plan, provided for me a Christian lady who would become my tutor. And my family didn't know she was Christian, but they were paying her to teach me the English language. Every day after school, she would read me uh, books to teach me the English language. In the second grade, she came up to me and she said, Afshin, I've been reading you all these books. Now I want to give you the most important book you'll ever get in your life. And she handed me a small New Testament. And she said, you're not going to understand this book, but promise me you'll hold on to it and read it when you're older. And God, she plants a seed in my life in the second grade that wouldn't come to fruition until 10 years later. And she gave it to me during the Iran hostage crisis, way before your time, but a group of Americans were held hostage in, in Iran for over a year. And so in this country, it was not easy to be from Iran and be an American. We had rocks thrown through our window in Houston because people knew we were from Iran. My parents' cars' tires were slashed. Older high school kids threatened to beat us up. And I'm not trying to throw a pity party here. I'm just trying to say this. Had any other American given me that New Testament, I would have thrown it in the trash can because I didn't trust many Americans. You want to win a Muslim for Christ? You want to win a non-Christian for Christ? I believe you got to earn the right to be heard. And she did it by the way she loved me and she poured her life into me and taught me English and gave me a New Testament, told me to read it later. I took it home, threw it in my house, and I grew up a Muslim, not just any Muslim. My dad was the president of the Islamic Medical Society in Houston. He was chairman of the board of the Iranian Islamic Center, so he was a very big time Muslim. So all I ever was taught is the five pillars of faith of Islam, that if I did them to the best of my ability, then maybe I'd get to heaven, was taught that Jesus is just a prophet. So my senior year in high school, I'm playing basketball in a gym like this, and I took the name of Jesus in vain. I said, Jesus, and a guy comes over to me and says, hey, that Jesus you just said, he's my God. No, no, he's not, he's your prophet. He goes, no, he's my God. I thought the guy was nuts. So I went home, and I, all of a sudden I go, man, who really is this Jesus? And so I go, you know, I think I got a Bible somewhere. And if you can believe this, I go upstairs to my room, look all over my room, and found that small New Testament that that second grade tutor had given me 10 years ago. I found it at the bottom of my closet as a senior in high school. And I open it up, first book of Matthew, I'm excuse me, first book of the New Testament's Matthew. Starts off a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Now I knew Abraham being a Muslim, so that just drew me in. And guys, I read the whole book of Matthew in one sitting. I didn't understand it all, but guys, I would hide my reading from my parents under the covers with a flashlight I'd read. Every day at my high school, this Christian kid would come debate with me. I'd debate on the side of Islam. But every night I'd go home and read more about his Jesus without telling him, all right? So I kept reading and kept reading. And finally one day I got to the book of Romans. And in Romans, again, I heard about a righteousness. That means a right standing with God that comes apart from the law. Meaning apart from what I do for God. And it says that it comes through faith in Jesus Christ. What he has done to all who believe, and that all was big, because I thought I was born a Muslim, I was stamped a Muslim, I'd always be a Muslim. But that's it for any race, any ethnicity, any nation. And so a couple of weeks after that, I'm sitting at a football practice when a guy invited me to a Christian event uh, with a very peculiar name. Now, if you've studied your history, you'll know why this is funny. Remember, I'm a Muslim at the time. This dude comes up and goes, hey, Afshin, you want to come to this crusade with me? I'm like, uh. I go, bro, I'm a Muslim. You're inviting me to a thing called the crusade? He goes, oh, it has nothing to do with that. He goes, there's free pizza there. I go, oh, all right, I like crusade, all right? So I went. I went to this crusade, and I heard the gospel, and God intersected my life with the truth of the grace of Christ. 
And that day I went forward. I didn't even know what I was doing, but I said, I need Jesus. I gave my life to Christ. But hear me, I didn't understand the call of the gospel. That you sell everything. You lose everything to follow this Jesus. And so I didn't, listen to me, I didn't understand it. So I'm driving home from that crusade, and then it hits me. What am I going to tell my dad? What am I going to tell my father? What am I going to tell my family? Nobody sat me down at that crusade and said, oh, by the way, when you get home, your dad will be st still a Muslim. Good luck. Nobody said, oh, by the way, there's a cost to following Christ. Oh, you ought to know that Jesus says, if you're going to come my way, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That means there's a cost. Nobody told me that. And that's why I'm so passionate to tell you the whole truth. That there is a cost to following Christ. But students, if you understand, now don't misunderstand me. It's a free gift not to be earned, as I said. But it's not just this easy believism, oh, I believe the right things. It's a commitment of your very life to follow him. People don't want to talk about that. But I tell you guys, we're talking about unseen. You with me? Some of you are never going to see the life Christ has for you because you're never going to turn from idols to serve him. Listen, Jesus says it this way. Uh, he says that, that you have, again, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And right after that, in Matthew 16, 25, he says, for anyone who wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Listen to me now, eyes up here. Some of you, you want to follow Christ, but there is an idol in your life that you're holding on to. It's like when Jesus said to the man, come follow me, he said, let me go first bury my dad. And that didn't mean his dad had just passed away. It probably means let me receive my inheritance. Let me wait for my dad to grow old, die, let me bury him. So, man, I want to follow you, Jesus, but I also want to hold on to all this stuff, the American dream, so to speak. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. And so we're talking about unseen. Jesus says, you're going to see a life that's going to be used for my glory if you would lose it for me. And so I'm, i, I got to be honest with you. I'm ashamed to tell you this. But I hid my faith from my dad. I didn't lose my life. I said, no way am I going to tell my dad this. So I would sneak out to go to church. I would hide my Bible. I'd intercept mail from the church I was attending. And finally one day my dad found out. He'd seen my Bible. He'd seen other evidences in my life. And he sits me down. And he says, son, what's going on? I go, dad, what do you mean? He said, there's something different about you. And I said, well, dad, um, I'm a Christian. He said, excuse me? I said, I'm a Christian. He said, no, you're not, young man. You're a Muslim, and you'll always be a Muslim. And I said, Dad, the Bible says if I trust in Christ for my salvation, then I'm a Christian, and I do. And my dad said, Afshin, if you're going to be a Christian, then you can no longer be my son. And that's when it first nailed me, guys. Here's a, here's a, a God I've known for a year and a half. Here's my dad, my entire, uh, my hero at the time, uh, you know, the guy who raised me, my culture, everything. This was my idol. And i, I got to be honest. Everything in me wanted to lose my dad. I didn't want to lose my dad. So in my flesh, I, I, I was going to say, forget it. I'll be a Muslim. I didn't want to lose him. And I share that so you know I'm not bragging today. Because it wasn't me. I believe it was the power of God. Because even I was surprised when I opened my mouth and I said to my dad, Dad, if I have to choose between you and Jesus, then I choose Jesus. And if I have to choose between my earthly father and my heavenly father, then I choose my heavenly father. And my dad said, then you're no longer my son. Get your stuff and get out of here. Disown me on the spot. I walk upstairs to my room. This is the definitive moment of my life. I fell on my face and I said, God, how could you do this to me? I said, Jesus, if you're real, how could you take my dad away from me? And the Lord spoke to me. He said, open the word. And guys, I turn in the word to Matthew 10. Don't turn there, just listen now. Listen to the words of Jesus that I read right after my dad disowned me. Listen to this. Jesus says, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him. Then it goes on. Here's where it really gets crazy. Remember, right after my dad disowned me, then I, then I read, Do not suppose I came to bring peace to the earth. I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. And then Jesus says, For I have come to turn a man against his father. And I'm like, whoa. That just happened for me. A daughter against her mother. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. 
Anyone who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And then again, whoever finds his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And guys, let me tell you what that means. It doesn't mean that God hates the family and wants to tear up the family. But here's what it means. That even that precious relationship of a family should not come between you and following Christ. And even that would be like hate compared to your love and your devotion to following Jesus regardless of the cost. Turn from idols to serve him. It, has the gospel truly changed you? Have you lost it all? What is your faith costing you to follow Jesus today? For me, it was my dad. For you, it may be something else. For you, it may be another uh, a sin that you got to bring out into the light. It may be another relationship that you may have to lose. It may be another dream that you may have to let go of. But some of you unseen, you're never going to see the life that God wants to have through you because you're holding on to that idol. Let me share really quickly the rest of my story and we'll get to my last point. After that, I went to college. And I, I, I have so much to tell you, but I don't have a whole lot of time. It's unbelievable. God gave me a roommate. I went potluck, a roommate who was also from a Muslim background, who also was disowned by his dad. It was unbelievable, okay? So many stories I could tell you. But listen, my dad took me back in, but only on a provisional basis. As long as I'd go be a doctor and make him proud. My dad was a doctor. He was going to pay for my entire medical school. And I was going to take over his practice and be set for life. But God was calling me into ministry, and I knew it. And so I ran from God. For a year and a half I ran, until finally my sister, who had become a Christian, wrote me a letter. And she said, Afshin, you're running from God's call on your life. And she said, Afshin, a Christian out of God's will is like a fish out of water. He will struggle until he's put back in the water. And guys, I was struggling. And she quoted 1 John 2, 17, which says, The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Are you serving him and his will? And so the hardest thing I had to do was take my dad to lunch. My hand was shaking. The food got there, the dessert. How about a refill of coffee? All this, I'm procrastinating. And finally I look at my dad. I'm about to graduate and go to med school. I said, Dad, I'm not going to medical school. I said, I'm going to seminary. He goes, what's seminary? I go, I'm going to go train to be a, a pastor. And he called it the biggest stain on his life. He said, it is, as if you, it is as if you have died. And I said, Dad, you know how much I love you, how much I want you to be proud of me. And guys, that was my dream for my dad to be proud of me. I said, you know how much I want that. And my dad said, son, not only will I never be proud of you, but I'll always be ashamed of you as long as I live. Now, those are the hardest words for a man to hear from his father. But is God faithful? Listen, I went to Dallas, Fort Worth, with $4 in my pocket, didn't have a job, only had my first semester's tuition paid for by my church to go to seminary, and I'm telling you, within two months, I had a free place to live. I had a job at a church where I became the pastor's intern. Then I started preaching at that church. And I share this not to post, but boast, but to show you God's um, glory here. Then after that, I start preaching around Dallas, then around Texas, then around the country. God has given me a nationwide speaking ministry the last 15 years. My story has been put in magazines that have gone all over the world, reach Muslims. Why? Because I'm an amazing speaker or because I have a great resume? No, man. Because God had a plan for my life, man. And he's got a plan for your life. And he wants you. Quit living life for yourself and die to that idol and turn to him. I'm telling you, if you would just say, Jesus, I lose my life, what could God do through you? And so the coolest thing is my relationship with my dad has been restored. He's not a Christian yet. We're still praying for that. But we talk all the time. But on top of that, there's a ministry in Iran where um, the ministry is actually based in England. It's called Elam Ministries. And this ministry reaches into Iran through the underground church. If you don't know about Iran, Iran is hostile to Christianity, close to the gospel. The, this, this ministry finds out about me. They skip the pond. They come take me to dinner. They go, wait a minute, you speak English and Farsi? I'm like, yeah. You travel the country and preach? I'm like, yeah. And they go, you're the guy we're looking for. And I'm like, for what? And no joke, the leader of this ministry goes, you know how we're going to overthrow the Islamic government in Iran? And I'm like, uh... I remember thinking, I don't know, Jack Bauer? I don't know. I mean, uh, un and so he, no joke, he looks at me, no, he looks at me and says, by evangelizing the country one by one, 
will you help us? I go, how can I help you? So you ready for this? I can't get into Iran. My story's all over the internet. Iran is close to me. But there's a neighboring country where there's an underground training site where Iranian men and women who've come to faith in Christ and feel called to the ministry, they come to this neighboring country and guess who gets to go there twice a year to teach them in my native language how to preach and how to do evangelism and they go back into Iran today to plant underground churches. Okay, now listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Today, now, today, I could be a doctor and have my dad proud of me. I could. But I would have missed the life Christ had for me. And so I say, if you want to save your life, you're losing it, man. Your hand is all over your life, you're losing it. But if you say, Jesus, I understand the gospel call is to take up my cross and follow you, I'll lose my life, then you're going to find life. One last thing I want to say about these Thessalonians. Look at it real quickly with me. So they were transformed by the gospel. They turned from God, I mean from idols to God. And then look at verse 8. Look what happens. Then they multiply. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. So listen to me, this is how I want to close our time. When the gospel intersects your life, you lose all the follow him. And let me tell you, the, the gospel is a sending gospel by its nature. Just as Jesus stepped out of heaven and got uncomfortable and left his position in glory and came to a broken world that spat on him, that beat him, that bruised him, that crucified him. The gospel says, if you understand that Christ has done that for you, that you would get uncomfortable, leave your comfort zone, and go, and that the word of your faith would sound forth everywhere. But some of you are, have, are gonna have to get uncomfortable and go. And so, if you go from the very beginning, God tells Abraham, leave your father's country, get uncomfortable. Go to a land that I will show you. But listen to what he says. I'm going to make you a great nation, but it's not going to be just about you. From you, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's Jesus. So God used Abraham to spread his gospel through Jesus to all of the families of the earth. But Abraham had to leave. Abraham had to get uncomfortable just as Jesus stepped out. Abraham stepped out. Then Jesus comes in John, and he looks at his disciples, and he says this. He says, I am the good shepherd. I lay my life down for the sheep. And then he says this, but I have other sheep that are not of this fold. In other words, it's not just about your group. There's others that you have maybe thought are the enemy, okay, that don't look like you, that don't smell like you, that don't dress like you. Get out of your clique, out of your comfort zone. Go. I must draw them also, Jesus says, so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. And then in Acts chapter 10, Peter walks into a Gentile man's home. And I'm telling you, that's major racism. I mean, a major, excuse me, racist divide, Jew and Gentile. And he walks into a Gentile man's home, preaches the gospel, the Holy Spirit falls upon them, they baptize these Gentiles, and when Peter goes home, don't miss this, the good Christians rebuke Peter for what he did. How dare you preach to the Gentiles, they said. And Peter says, if they receive the same Holy Spirit that we received, who am I to stand in God's way? In the Bible, one of my favorite verses says in Acts 10, that the church fell silent and they glorified God because they understood the message of the gospel was not just for the Jew, but for the Gentile. So the gospel transforms, the gospel causes you to lose your idols to serve him, and the gospel sends you. And I pray that you would, you, would, you would embrace that. I want to close our time with a story that has impacted my wife and I. And this is the last story. I want you to sit up. I promise this story will rock your face off, okay? But you got to get this story, okay? It's a young man. I want you to get his story, and then we'll be done. Every eye up here, I don't know if you can see this book. I don't know if I can put it on the screen. Can you all see this book? All right, there it is. This book is called I Would Die For You. It's a story about this young man named B.J. Higgins. And I want you to hear his story, and then we'll be done. Listen to this. B.J. Higgins accepted Christ at the age of eight. Now, he wasn't in the youth group, 
his father was a pastor and drug him to the youth meeting, heard the gospel, his life was changed. BJ at the age of 9 and 10, sharing his faith with his uh, uh, classmates on the school bus, I'm not making this up. At the age of 13, 14, his parents say he's online sharing his faith, okay. BJ's parents would come and say, get to bed. And BJ would say, mom, dad, I'm sharing my faith. And they're like, what do we do with that, you know? <laughs> now guys, I'm not trying to put this guy on a pedestal. I want you to see one kid who understood it's not about this world, that my life is meant to speak, the, to sound forth the gospel to all the world in the little amount of time I have left. And so BJ felt called to the mission field. And he felt called to Morocco, specifically in Africa. And he told his older sister, you and I are going to go to Morocco. Well, before BJ made it to Morocco, BJ went on a mission trip to Peru, and he contracted a rare disease. And after a six-month battle with this disease, BJ Higgins passed away and went to be with the Lord. And this book is written by his parents, Brent and Deanna Higgins, taking the writings of a young teenager, and you'd be shocked what a 14, 15 year old was writing in his, in his journal. Let me just read a portion of it for you. BJ writes, it's time that we, as the professed Christians of America, wake up from our sleep of lethargy and hypocrisy and stop only living for Christ on Sundays and Wednesdays and start acting as Christ says all of his disciples must act. As he says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We must die to ourselves daily. We must forget our comfort zones and our cliques of friends and go out and share the love and rescuing truth of Jesus Christ with the lost, empty, suffering, and dying people of the world all around us as Christ has commanded. 14, man. 15. Writing this. Now, I was in the Middle East training pastors when my wife bought this book. And I came home. She hands me the book. She goes, you're not going to believe this. Turn to page 32. And I turn to page 32, and it says, when BJ was in elementary school, he had just heard Afshin Ziafat speak, and he accepted Christ. So I was the guy that preached when this kid accepted Christ at the age of eight. Now, in case you think I'm boasting, first of all, you can never boast for salvation. It belongs to God. But in case you do, I did some research. You ready for this? This was my first outside speaking engagement ever. So you know my message was horrible, right? Like Jesus loves you, amen, right? But look what, hey, listen to me. Don't tell me God can't use you. Now listen, his parents found us online. They go, you led our son to Christ. I go, I know, I got the book, you know? And they go, well, we live in Oklahoma. I go, well, I'm gonna be in Oklahoma next week. Well, we'd love to take you to dinner. And I don't even remember what I ate. I bawled crying. Now listen to the rest of the story. Because you might say, why would God take a 15-year-old who's passionately sharing his faith because you got to understand, BJ's mission in life was not about this world, but about his, war, his life to make an impact for eternity. And so his parents told us that after the funeral, they took BJ's ashes with the older sister and they went to Morocco. And they went on a hill overlooking a Muslim village and they spread out BJ's ashes on that hill. And they prayed for that Muslim village and they came back home. They thought nothing more of it. Later they found out that the Muslim guide who took him to the top of that hill, was so impacted by BJ's life that he gave his life to Christ. And today, ready for this, that same guy is now the pastor of the underground church in that Moroccan village. So listen to me. Yeah, yeah. So BJ's life, BJ's life literally through his death is impacting North Africa. One more story. BJ's dad goes to Kenya. Sitting on a bus, a Sudanese young man comes and sits down next to him. He starts sharing his faith with this young man, and the guy goes, oh, I know Jesus, I just don't have a Bible. And BJ's dad goes, no, because the only Bible he had with him was the Bible that had BJ's writings in it, and he preaches from that Bible. And he says, I can't give up this Bible. I, I just can't do it. And so, and so man, uh, he, he wrestles with God, then finally God says, give him the Bible. He gives him the Bible, and he prays for the, God, God, he says, I just got to pray for you. And as he's praying for this young man, God says to Brent Higgins, Brent, you're praying for the next evangelist in East Africa. And when he finishes praying, he goes, you're going to be an evangelist one day, young man. He's got BJ's Bible. He's like, you're going to be an evangelist one day. He goes, I know. He goes, hey, I'm just curious. How old are you? You guessed it. 15 years old. 
and he has BJ's Bible today, preaching the, the, the gospel in East Africa. Now listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. I want to close, but listen to this now. There are people in the Middle East today that I have trained in Iran. My good friend Farshid has been in prison for a year and a half. He took his daughter to school, dropped her off, got a phone call, and it was the authorities, and they were at his house with his wife. They said, come home. And he first calls the ministry and says, pray for me, not just for my release, but pray that I would suffer well as I go to prison. But more than that, pray that through my suffering, more people would know about Jesus in my country. And I ask you, how can that be what it looks like to follow Christ over there? And what are we doing over here? And so I say, Jesus says it this way, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. Listen to me, students. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. Now, BJ literally had to die. You might not literally have to die, but some of you may have to die to yourself. Some of you may have to die to a dream. Some of you may have to die to a relationship and say, Jesus, I want my life to be used for you. And look what God can do through you. So I want you to bow your head with me. I want you to close your eyes all over this room. And I want us to respond to God's word. And I don't want you to get up and leave unless it's an emergency. Because I believe this to be the most important time as we respond to God's word. And so let me just ask you, just very straightforward, let me just ask you. Has the gospel truly changed you? Do you truly have a relationship with Christ? And listen to me, man. I believe when you understand what you're getting in Jesus, you step out and you say, I'm yours. Thank you for saving me when I was dead. Thank you for saving me when I had no hope. Thank you for saving me when I was destined for wrath and eternity separate from you. And I just wonder, has, have you really trusted in him? Jesus says, my sheep, they know me and they follow me. And they don't follow a strange voice. So don't play games tonight. Do you really follow Christ? Jesus says, in the end times, many will come to him and say, I perform miracles in your name. And he would say, depart from me, for I never knew you. So if there's people performing miracles in the name of Christ that Jesus says, I don't know you, how many of us sitting in churches would he say, I never knew you? So be honest, man. Has there been a time in your life, man, when you understood the gospel and you didn't try to do more good things, but you surrendered your life? The gospel calls you to quit striving, to surrender. When you're arrested by the gospel, you stop trying and you say, God, have mercy on me. Has that happened for you? And once it transforms you, you live for him. And some in this room, you might say, man, I'm not sure if that's really happened for me. And why not tonight, man? Why not tonight? You just step out and say, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I've seen other people do it, uh, but I'm not sure if I were to die today and stand before Jesus, if he would even recognize me as someone who's followed him. And God is calling you by his voice and saying, come follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. Your life will be not for you anymore. Your life will be used for something greater. So how many of you, how many of you want to respond to that, man? How many of you say, I'm ready to follow Jesus? So if you're here, don't do it, don't play games. But if you're saying, man, Afshin, I'm ready, I want tonight. It's not like a magical thing. It's just tonight you understand what Christ has done. And tonight you're saying, I'm ready to stand for him and follow him. Some of you, as surely as your heart is beating, you know God is all over you. And so I challenge you tonight, you stand for Christ. So if you're here tonight, you don't know Jesus, and you're saying, I'm ready to follow him with all that I am, live my life for him, I want you to stand up right now. Come on, stand up. All over this place, stand up right now. Anybody? Come on, stand up. Praise the Lord for one, two. Come on, stand. I'm ready to give my life to follow Jesus.
You guys stand. You guys keep standing. In fact, I want you in front of everybody to make your way. And let me tell you, we're going to rejoice. How many of you are rejoicing that people are coming to Christ? I want you, listen to me, I want you to stand.